Hi, everyone. Welcome to Your Money Matters. I am Angela Jarrell, publisher of The Bauman Letter. And speaking of The Bauman Letter, if you want more details on how you can get in on Ted's newsletter and his model portfolio and his weekly webinars and so much other stuff, make sure you click the link above because it's got all the details there on how you can join risk free. Now, we've spoken a lot this year about <laughs> the deceptive markets. I know I've opened with this a few times, but it's just been an ongoing theme that we've had a handful of stocks really generating the bulk of the gains in the market. And it's like this market keeps wanting to pull back, but the buyers are diving in, they're buying the dip and they're not allowing that to happen. But now, I don't know if, if things might change because of what's going on, but it looks like the Fed is serious about ending QE. And now people, again, are, are nervous about inflation and they demand that the Fed is going to raise rates and, and there's all this sort of building pressure. So if that happens and the dip buyers say sayonara, what's going to happen and what's the best place to park your money in that sort of worst case scenario? Ted, I'd like to open up those questions to you to start. Sure. Well, I think it's uh, it's useful to look at just how um, extreme that dominance by the top five have been. I, I put, I grabbed a couple of charts. Uh, here's one that shows the, uh, you know, kind of graphically, it shows the stocks, the top stocks that have outperformed uh, and how much they've outperformed and also their share of the uh, S&P 500's uh, return this year. I mean, one of the biggest ones is actually a you know, stock that we hold in the Bauman letter up and give you a freebie. It's, it's not like anybody would... <laughs> Um, it's, it's, it's Microsoft. I mean, it's just, you know, look at that. I mean, they, basically, it, when you have a stock that big that's outperforming that much um, and it has that much weight in, in the, the index, then, you know, you're going to get this kind of thing. But look at the bottom left corner. That's everybody else, right? And, and most of those stocks have had a, a pretty pedestrian year, right? I mean, they just, you know, the, the top one, if, if I look at it, is, it's, you know, around 2%. But it's really, it's, it's been the year of these big companies. Here, here's a second chart, and I threw this one in there, even though it's it's a god-awful chart, just because <laughs> it just shows you, somebody actually did a, a pie chart that showed all 500, or whatever they are right now, um, stocks in, in the S&P 500, um, you know, by their weight. And, um, you know, by the time you get down to the small ones, it looks like an ant farm. Uh, but basically, the you know, that's the stocks that have driven the market this year. And, and the reason that's important, I think, is, is that for two reasons. One is that, you know, the, people keep asking, well, why is the index looking good? And, you know, why are specific stocks not doing well? Well, there's your answer. The specific stocks are in the ant farm, right? They're in that little messy bit there, or they're in that little cluster in the first graph. And so, you know, unless you're going to buy an index fund, um, you know, th this is why we've had such a hard time with the smaller stocks this year. Um, having said that, though, you know, there are questions, even for the big stocks, as to what would happen if the Fed started to withdraw liquidity from the market. Um, and, you know, that's not a direct thing. It's not like, you know, the Fed prints money and then it goes straight out to buy, you know, money on the stock or, or stocks in the stock market. Um, but, you know, to the extent that it makes other things less attractive, it's helped this whole process, particularly the big ones, because the big ones, something that I think a lot of people forget Low interest rates mean these big guys have extremely low costs of capital, and that gives them the, the ability to expand either organically or through acquisitions in ways that nobody smaller than them can, can uh, do. All that comes into question now. All right. Now, Clint, if we could talk about this market breadth a little bit, because uh, as far as I know, when you have, you know, uh, really good market breadth and, and the, it's sort of spread out among a bunch of different stocks, that means you've got a, a high quality market, but it's not exactly what we're seeing now. So can we just talk a little bit more about that market breadth? Yeah, I mean, we, we've talked about breadth a, a lot this year and, and for good reason. And I think um, really since you know, with what's transpired in the market since late November, it's something to pay very close attention to right here. And so I wanted to uh, just, just highlight, you know, breadth is kind of a catch-all term. There's a lot of different ways to, to measure it, to describe it, and, and to monitor it. And so I wanted to go into uh, a few of the things that uh, we're watching, you know, to monitor it, the warning signs to look for, um, but, but why, you know, it can also be a little bit deceiving as well. So, yeah, I mean, the, the first thing, the first key point is that, look, we, we've talked a lot about high quality this year, you know, and you just mentioned uh, the quality advance. I mean, that's really what it comes down to when you're measuring uh, stock market participation, you know, a, a high quality advance is one where you see 
uh, across the board, stocks, you know, moving higher when, when you're in an uptrend and vice versa. So the first chart I want to start with uh, really shows a, a tale of, of two different markets uh, coming out of the pandemic, coming out of the, the bear market when the stock market sold off in early 2020 in the pandemic. So that's kind of where we're going to start with this chart. Uh, and then this goes all the way through their current day. And there's, there's a couple things on here. The blue line is the S&P 500 itself, uh, corresponding to the scale on the left. This black line, this is a percent of stocks above a 100-day moving average. Now, you know, the 50-day moving average or the 200-day moving average, they get a lot of attention. Uh, I like to monitor the 100-day moving average as just kind of a, a good intermediate uh, measure for what's going on with the market's breadth. And really, the, the, this tale of two markets, I drew a, a line on here. Um, to show you the, these two different periods on here. So coming out of the pandemic, uh, up until where this line exists, it's about uh, February of 2021. Um, you can see uh, kind of on this point when the S&P was making uh, new highs at this time, you know, this, this measure was running over 90%. Now that, that's actually abnormally strong, um, but that's just a, a sign of how broad based uh, the market's gains were uh, at this point in time. But look at what's happened since then, you've continued to see the S&P 500 march steadily higher uh, while this gauge has just kept on moving lower. I mean, at one point we were making uh, new highs on the S&P and this metric was only at, at 50%. Uh, most recently, when we were at new highs, uh, we were, you know, this only recovered to about 60%. So it just goes to show you kind of underneath the hood versus what we were seeing earlier this year, uh, how it's deteriorated. So this is one way to measure it. Another way is to look at new highs and new lows. Uh, and there's a couple ways to, to use that. You know, one, one sign you don't want to see is a, a growing number of new highs in the stock market and a growing number of new lows at the same time. That tells you there, there's something, uh, something bad is going on. But what you also don't want to see is as the market's advancing, you don't want to see, you want to see new highs expand. You don't want to see new lows expand. And that's what we've seen this year. So here's a chart of the S&P 500. This is year to date. Uh, with 52-week new lows. Now, this isn't just new lows in the S&P 500 index. This is a, across the market because, once again, we're, we're trying to measure uh, not just in the S&P, but across the market how things look. And you can see uh, as the year went on, as the S&P was moving higher, you start seeing the, these new lows uh, keep expanding. This, this black line on here corresponds to the scale on the right, and it, and it keeps moving higher. And you, you get to the point to where you know I've got the, uh, the arrow drawn uh, on the S&P 500 when we were kind of you know, hitting these highs on the year and look at the, the circle at, at how uh, much the 52-week new lows grew despite the market being at, at high. So, I mean, it just goes to show you um, the, how, how broad-based it is with how many stocks are struggling um, underneath the hood right now. Now, the, uh, the, the last metric I want to show, something else that I track closely and I, I think you're probably going to start to hear uh, a lot more in the news is with something called uh, the advanced decline line. You know, specifically, it's, it's for the New York Stock Exchange, the advanced decline line. All this does is it looks each day at how many stocks are advancing versus declining, takes the difference between the two, and then adds it to the prior day. So when you, when you start this going back, you kind of keep this cumulative running total, and it's just a way to represent what the average stock is doing. Uh, so here's how uh, that line looks relative to the S&P this year. This is a year-to-date chart. The S&P is the black line on top, and this blue line, uh, is that advanced decline line on the bottom. And what you want to see is this AD line, you know, leading the way or at least keeping up with the index. And, and you had that with where I circled in green on here. This was uh, just going into November, small caps were doing really well. The S&P moved out to new highs. And this, this blue line was confirming that. Most recently, when I got circled in orange, you got the S&P, you know, rebounding after this dip, but this, uh, this AD line barely going anywhere. And so I think people are going to start to pay close attention to that. Does that mean that the bubble is bursting? Well, um, deteriorating breath like this can actually go on uh, for quite some time before you start to see really some, you know, the big indexes like the S&P uh, roll over. And that's the last chart I want to show on here. So same thing, S&P uh, versus the advanced decline line. But this goes back uh, to the last big valuation bubble, the dot-com bubble. And what you can see is that the S&P um, from, from January 1998 through early 2000, the S&P kept grinding higher. Uh, meanwhile, this blue line was just, was just collapsing. So you can have uh, breadth continue to, to look very bad, to be uh, very poor. Uh, yet, you know, as Ted's pointing out with the, uh, the big stocks and the S&P driving the market, that can, that can last uh, for quite some time as the, uh, as the tech bubble had showed us. Ted, what do you see happening here? Any warnings for us? 
Well, I mean, I, you know, obviously it's difficult to, uh, you know, to extrapolate directly from history, but I mean, I think, you know, the, the critical thing as Clint's pointing out is that if you, you know, it, it's like Jenga, right? I mean, you know, you're, you're taking pieces away, all those stocks that are declining as opposed to, to rising, but the tower is still there. And eventually, you know, you pull out one that makes the tower collapse. Now, I'm not necessarily saying that's going to happen right away. As Clint pointed out, you can get a long slide. Um, but, you know, the, the history of the, of the dot-com bust, which a lot of investors weren't around for at this point, you know, a lot of current investors don't didn't experience that, is that you got this stuff moving under the hood, and yet people were still bullish, 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 and then eventually it did all collapse, and when it did, it collapsed quickly. Now, the, the thing, I think, the backdrop right now is that ever since the great financial crisis and the Fed started with this mega QE joining the Bank of Japan that had already been doing it, and then the European Central Bank doing it, um, what's happened is that we've got to a, a situation where it's very difficult to know what the actual market clearing price of a lot of critical assets are. In other words, because the reference point, which is you know bonds uh, and the return on bonds, has been artificially uh, suppressed, um, you know people have been bidding things up way beyond what they would do under quote unquote normal positions. So the big question is what happens now if the Fed tightens? Here's a chart that shows what tends to happen with the S and P 500 when the Fed starts a hiking cycle. I think I showed this a couple of weeks back. And basically since 1950, the best scenario is if the Fed tightens slowly, uh, and which is I think what the market is, is looking at right now. I mean, they're basically saying, if the Fed tightens, it's not gonna happen all at once unless some, you know, some bizarre kind of scenario happens, uh, which we're not expecting. But the other thing is that when you have high inflation, which is the other problem we have right now, slow tightening plus high inflation would put put us somewhere in the middle of that, which means that um, after a, a pretty big run up, um, you would probably see a much flatter market going forward, which means that you can't expect the big gains that you've had in the past, um, or else if you do, you're gonna find them elsewhere. And, and that's something that I wanted to talk about uh, in particular, and I'll come to that in a minute, but one of the things that uh, you gotta be uh, to watch out for, and this happened during the dot-com bust, was that you had a lot of uh, dead cat bounces. Here's a chart that shows rallies between the uh, March 2000 high and the uh, October 2000 and low. Now, what that means is that the market fell um, significantly from March to, to October, but look at some of the rallies. Um, and some of those rallies lasted for a while, but then they collapsed again. So it's, it's really difficult to tell whether a rally is going to be sustainable or not. And, you know, that's probably going to, to cause a lot of difficulties for uh, for, for investors. But here's the critical thing. What's the rally based on? In the dot-com era, it was based on the notion that these stocks were going to actually do things and people went back to their um, to their initial thesis and they reconvinced themselves that, that, that everything was going to be okay. And so they started buying back in again. And so you had these rallies. Right now, it's all interest rate based. And right now we have so many high multiple stocks that have thin or unpredictable or no profits at all. Those companies have to, those stocks have to derate. In other words, they have to come down to lower multiples. And if you're not earning profits, there's no way to compensate for, for you know, multiple compression. Um, there's a guy who writes in to me a lot uh, on the Bauman letter. I always appreciate hearing from him. And he's always criticizing me for, for not being bullish, uh, you know, on Kathy Woods and her ARC stuff. I'm sure he's going to write into me again after this video, <laughs> but I just wanted to show you. I mean, his this is his thesis right here, right? Here's the first chart. He he starts back in January 20 and says, "Look at that. I mean, geez, you're up. You know, look how much more you're up um, than the market." And I've also included included a couple of ETFs in there that I'm going to come back to in a moment. Now, here's my take. There's the same performance, but since the beginning of this year. Okay, so. The blue line is ARC. That's basically all the you know the, the next generation stuff. The red line is the the the, the S and P five hundred. Uh, the green line is actually a, a small cap quality stocks and growth stocks. These are small cap stocks that are earning good money and growing quickly. They're not uh, growth stocks that are not earning money. Look how they've outperformed. Not just the market, but you know these these future oriented stocks. So it's great. If you bought them two years ago, you're still up. But look how much you know you would have lost if you bought them in January. The the orange line, on the other hand, is what they call cash cows. That's why it's called C O W Z, uh, and it's an ETF that holds companies that produce a lot of free cash flow. Uh, so you know the critical thing is now that we're we're looking at a scenario where people are starting to price in Fed, um, you know, rolling back QE, uh, and of course today we're risk off because there's bad news about current 
you know, and Omicron, but that's going to, that's just noise at this point because nobody knows any. But the key thing is that the Fed starts to pull back on this money. These stocks are going to derate and you're going to, uh, going to want to look at other kinds of stocks that have much more defensive uh, characteristics. Here's a chart that um, kind of complex, but I found it this morning and it shows industries that are likely to do well um, given various scenarios. So if you get sl a slowing in the economy, that's the producer uh, manufacturing index. If the dollar is getting stronger, if you get tighter financial conditions, which is the Fed uh, pulling back on QE and uh, a falling global money supply, then this is what this model um, thinks is going to happen. This comes from Stifel, um, a, um, a, an analyst house. And basically what they're saying is this is you want to be in defenses or, def or defensives. You want to be pharmaceuticals, foods and staples, commercial and professional services, healthcare. you know, basically this stuff that people need constantly. Um, they, they always need this stuff. On the other hand, uh, capital goods, materials, tech, financials, uh, automobiles, semiconductors, that stuff might not do so well. So uh, the critical thing, though, is within each of these sectors, there are going to be some companies that are going to be doing well because of their unique characteristics which means you're going to have to look hard for them, which is what we do. It's exactly what we do at the Bauman Letter. Funny you should mention that. <laughs> Wait, I know you, you had an idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just real quick. Um, you know, one, one way to uh, one ETF to play some of the themes that you're talking about, Ted, especially on the, the defensive side, uh, is with ETF SPLV. It's an Invesco low volatility ETF. Uh, it's simply the, the one, you know, it looks over the past year at the 100 stocks in the S&P 500 with the lowest realized volatility in, in their share price. And, you know, why they have that low vol, I mean, it could be any number of reasons, whether it's the, the stability of their end markets, uh, maybe they have a, a good moat and they operate high margin businesses, uh, whatever the case may be, but over 50% of, of that ETF uh, is in uh, those defensive sectors. And just real quick, here's a chart of, of SPLV over the past year. Um, you know, despite some of the, the weakness that we're seeing uh, in various areas of the market, this is one area uh, that's been holding up and has actually been breaking out to, uh, to new highs here. You can see this, this recent move over that, that $65 level here uh, was key for SPLV. So that, that's, you know, one holding those types of companies that are, are starting to benefit in this uncertain environment. All right. Well, and, and Ted, as you mentioned, the Bauman letter, mm -hmm. it's always mm -hmm. a great solution for everyone watching. Yeah, and, and we are, you know, we're aiming for for companies that that have guaranteed revenues right now at this point, and and I think that's the prudent thing to do. So, uh, our last couple of picks um, have been companies that that are um, kind of leaning into really strong demand growth, you know, for a variety of reasons, uh, and we're doing that again this month um, with something um, that is really a, a, one of the biggest um, boosters of demand for this particular company that that's come along in the last fifty years. So. Uh, go where the money is. <laughs> that's what that's what we're doing. Um, and remember, stocks uh, go up um, for all kinds of reasons, but in the long run, they go up when they earn a lot of money, when the companies do. And so that's why we're favoring those kind of companies. So again, if you want more details, click the link above. Ted and Clint, thank you very much. Uh, thank you folks for watching. And if you have any comments, please leave them below. Otherwise, we'll see you next week. <laughs>